Um, well, first of all, I have to say that it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm extremely honoured to be opening this amazing conference, three days of... I notice you're not calling it a conference, these three contemporary art days. Um, and so what I'm going to do today um, is begin to question the very terms of it. This is going to be quite a theoretical address, um, and I'm going to read from my screen, um, on the understanding that for the many of the rest of the time and the period you're going to spend together, you're going to be working intensively with artists that, have, um, that will um, be talking with you and discussing with you uh, uh, kind of very pragmatic, conceptual uh, working methodologies. So in a way, what my job is, is to begin the conference by opening up some broad themes. And I've chosen to, 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 to concentrate on the idea of the public per se. Um, and that's why I've called the talk Forgetting the Public. So um, what I want to do in the beginning, I guess, is modify the modes through which the event's core concepts are thought and practised, both generally, so in general, the concept of the public as we understand it, as a political and social term, but also specifically within the field of contemporary art. So I'm going to suggest that we forget the idea of the public, and in this forgetting, begin to enact a radical gesture of social and spatial transformation that we, as artists, curators, writers, commissioners, producers, funders, are in a unique position to re-perform. I know that this is what, um, well, in, in my family, people would call a complete pain in the arse to ask you all to imaginatively engage with the eradication of the terminology and conceptual form that in, has in fact brought us all together. But bear with me for a few minutes. Before I begin to try and persuade you to join me in this process of forgetting the public, a few words about the context, and I think this is really important, and particularly at this moment of um, trans-migratory practices and crises that are affecting Europe in particular and the world more generally. We're in Sweden. I know, that's obvious. And Sweden is located at a particular and symbolic relation to the rest of Europe, wherein this idea of the public and the idea of public good, a term that is often and still used on a regular basis by many people, politicians and art producers and artists occasionally as well, although less so, I would have to say, artists. Um, this idea of the public and the public good has emerged over the course of the past 300 years. So the idea of public and the public good is a European invention. And this process of engagement and emergence and invention of the public is a process that, to be kind of... Um, uh, to... to, to, um, to Sweeping, sweep over um, a whole strange and complex historical paradigm, we can understand as a process that belongs to a European form of secular liberalism. But I note that the many practitioners speaking and presenting over the past few days, the next few days, sorry, um, that either come from or work in other parts of the world, where traditions and habits of spatial and psychic formation of gathering, community building, decision making, playing, celebrating and discoursing or arguing, the central tenets of which might be understood as the function of the concept of the public, are significantly different. We have to understand at the very beginning, the very beginning of these days, the beginning of our engagements and our arguments, that the concept of the public is an Anglo-European concept and has a substantial place in the history and geography of colonisation and its uneven, violent and always continuing correlative process of decolonisation. Because of time constraints, I will not talk about the incursions of public space within the juridical and governmental tactics of European colonisation. That is, how cities are formed, how they become formed, how public space is a weapon of hegemony within the extreme eradication of other forms of life that has occurred over the period of colonisation. But please bear this in mind as the unforgettable, if you will, backdrop of what I'm saying. So I'll come back to this idea of what we should forget and what we should not forget at the end of my quick talk. 
So what is this monster, the public? Normally we use the public to differentiate something, a space, an institution, a body of people, a voting decision, a housing scheme, etc., etc., from that which is private, by which we usually mean privately owned and maintained. The term has a long history, often related to ancient Greek renderings of the spatial parliamentary form of the polis. Its physical rendition in the architecture of our cities and towns has been diagnosed by lists of celebrated thinkers, including Jürgen Habermas, Hannah Arendt, Bruno Latour more recently, Laclau and Mouffe, Richard Sennett, Michael Warner, etc., etc. I'm sure there are many more names that you could add to this list. Each of whom, interestingly, has not argued for the eradication of the public, or the forgetting of the public, as I'm trying to do here, but for transformations in and, politi- and, po- and in, in its form and in the, partic- the political knowledge of the use of the public and public space. So these thinkers, there's a long tradition of European, Anglo-European, um, by which I'm also including, of course, the United States, of engagement with the public, not um, as a mechanism through which uh, we should um, move away, but something that we should alter, that we should engage with again and again, but in a different way, in an altered way, of course, but in a way that, is, um, that, is, that, that maintains the idea of the public. So, for instance, we've had counter-publics and post-publics and um, agonistic publics, etc., etc. But people want to keep hold of this concept of the public. Why? That's what I'm asking. In the end, these post-enlightenment thinkers want to reshape concepts of being public and using public space. They want to hold on to the idea, and of course I'm simplifying it greatly here because of time. They want to hold on to the idea of the public. I'm suggesting something different. I'm suggesting that every time we try and hold on to the public as the space in which gestures and actions have taken place or could take place in semblances of democracy and openness and in a public sphere in which we are constitutionally free, or so we think, we are lying to ourselves. The concept of the public has been politically, structurally and economically discredited over the course of the last hundred years. It is no secret that most public space is highly governed and often in economic fact is privatised. It is no secret that our free press, that which Jürgen Habermas bemoaned in its transformation, is in fact corporatized. It is no secret that in Europe both housing and education are either now completely privatized, and I'm exaggerating but I'm thinking very much from uh, the context of the UK where I'm uh, semi, semi-based, um, so it's nice, no secret that both housing and education are now completely privatized or in dangerous proximity to privatization. I know this is also floating above Sweden right now, this debate about housing and education. Our institutions, including our governmental and artistic institutions, are held in constant check through private sponsorship and patronage. But it's not simply the fact that what we have been fooled into maintaining is the illusion of publicness during a period of ideological privatisation, although of course this is true. We need to recognise that in addition to this, whilst we subscribe to and argue for the maintenance of the public, we in fact support a political structure deeply ingrained within Europe's complex historical formation of ordering and preserving a systematic, a systemic mapping of how our bodies and the bodies of others around us behave both in relation to ourselves, our families, our social lives and our habits. By this I mean that we behave through and as a public and it is in this performance that we maintain the sites and formations of being public that in turn shape our desires desires for things like public space and public institutions. In fact, one might say that the binaries that title this set of contemporary art days between dissent and discipline consensus versus conflict, etc., are binaries that are in fact themselves, themselves formed by and through the psychic, 
juridical and physical idea of the public in itself. We still think, even as we try not to, as and of the public. Now, of course, this is a difficult argument. No doubt you'll be thinking, but she wants to eradicate all public space in our cities, remove public institutions and stop our battle for public housing and education. I do not. But I do want to argue that the very shape of these vital provisions is made through a relation to the private body and the privacy of space. Through psychic retreat and social revelation. Through the giving of the public its publicness. A donation of political benevolence that is, in fact, a form of absolute control. Here the arts, and in particular contemporary visual art, although of course I only speak from my field, are key forms of public maintenance. So I'm saying that art, while so often poised as an alternative, as a, as a utopian alternative to, um, to the corporatization of the public sphere, in fact maintains it. So whilst housing activists and educational reformers try and fight to retain critical infrastructures of community and common hands, wherein they face long battles with the complexities of historical legislation over rights to access, etc., etc., and this happens all over the world, not just in Europe, it is within the arts that we hold dear the concept of the public as a utopian form of communicative space. We tend to treat public as a space and an engagement that is liberated from the constraints of its own governmentalized legacy. In particular, the categories of art's bureaucracy and the bureaucracy's desire, okay, I do believe that bureaucracy has desire. Um, so bureaucracy's desire is in the form of the maintenance of public and public space. Where they are all, where they are all, sorry, where they are still funded by pub, the public purse, which of course is complex argument that needs to be unpicked, and I haven't got time here to do with the relationship between taxation and concepts of the public and private and the personal and the and the um, and the communitarian, where they are still funded by the public purse, arts institutions are constantly asked to clarify and affirm their success in attracting a group of people called the public through their doors or into their spaces if they're working um, externally. And I'm sure there are many people in this room that are used to having to make those arguments. Certainly, I'm surrounded by people in the UK that have to make those arguments all the time. In this sense, and often the term, and often, the term public is a useful fiction that enables the continued argument for art's popularity. But it's a dangerous fiction. A long tradition of commissioning artists to make work in public space now exists. Um, one only has to look at the um, formidable writing of Rosalind Deutsch back in the 1990s to see a fantastic critique of this, or, or, a fantastic critique of public art um, already, you know, kind of um, historically in existence. Um, a long tradition of making things called public art and contemporary forms of engagement and relationality need to be understood as a direct continuation of, not an alternative to, these forms. This is infrastructural. It is psychic architecture. The artist gifts her creative force to the public. So, the complex is this. How to hold on to the important elements of publicness that have developed in European culture whilst forgetting and thus decolonizing ourselves from the processes that have constituted the always institutionalized concept of publicness in the first place. So it's a complex maneuver we have to do with our bodies and our minds, and we have to do collectively. How can the forms of forgetting that we practice allow us to transform publicness into an as yet unresolved form of egalitarianism? For this is the ever-present ever present, yet never achieved promise of being public. This is the kind of jewel that people want. Forms of egalitarianism within the public. And I'm saying that constitutionally, 
it's unavailable to us to think about the public and egalitarianism or equality in the same sentence, in the same thought form and practice. In its normative format under artistic and curatorial practice, sorry, in its normative format, such artistic and curatorial practice upholds the standardization of hierarchical power and placement within the European social spatial registers in which we live. I come here from Free's Art Fair, where public projects are on show, on private dealers' stands, often commissioned to offset business by other means, and rewarded by the, funder, by the further investment by the world's 1%. Public servants of art, there are many of us in this room, I would consider myself a public servant in that regard, biannual directors, art institution CEOs, small not-for-profit gallerists and their trustees and patrons, follow these... Um, roots of money, hungrily and desperately seeking investment in a public project on the basis of value accrual and cultural prestige elsewhere within the private sector. So this is our context, globally. But if contemporary art is a site that upholds and maintains this divisory form of publicness, where our bodies fit neatly into behaviours prescribed to us as audiences, participants, makers, commissioners, art also has the capacity to break up this idea of the public and, in many places, is already doing so. And I'm sure there will be many interesting um, examples of this discussed and um, displayed and enacted over the next few days. We know that what is extraordinary about the work of artists and curators working together with many other people is our, your, ability to bring non-schematic, non-governmentalised thoughts and images together in a historical and pan-geographical formation. This is the locus of art's ability to maintain an emancipatory function within a realm that we need to stop calling public. This is art's ability to work a publicly, but in order to think about and practice contemporary art as this emancipatory category, one that can add to and help reinvent structural and social imaginaries, we need to rid it of its fetishization and addiction to the public. And the way to do this might be as follows. So here, seven points, because it's easy. Right, so firstly, one, stop dividing practitioners from each other. Work together, not as monads. Two, dismantle habitual exhibition formats. The private installation, the opening, the exclusive party, the division already at the doors of the institution between those people that have access to knowledge and education about spaces of art and those that don't. Three, credit artists with skills that are transferable and are not privatised. Four, allow the development of work to be porous and non-exclusive. That relates, obviously, to the institutions. Five, rethink what studio practice is, so what, what people do as how we educate artists, how we are artists and curators. I would argue that the studio is the place where the artist is private before she reveals her work to the public. And this is an endemic and structural problem in our understanding of the artist's role within this emancipatory project that I am desiring. Six, dismantle collections, both public and private, completely. So I'm not asking for a great deal here, obviously. Instead, inv invest in artefactual history and recognise the work of artists alongside other makers, not separate from them. Seven, maintain the role of the artist who, only ever collaboratively, poses the question, what if we placed this image next to this historical fact? What if we went there and learned about what those people do and think about it in our own terms and try and learn from theirs? In other words, clarify the role of the artist outside of her own privatisation, her own property making. In Europe, we will always be haunted by the public. 
It is in the structure of our tissue. So in the act of forgetting, we will retain this memory. We can't rid ourselves of it entirely. I'm not that unrealistic. We need to ask seriously, in this forgetting, what is worth a memory? For others, the forgetting of the memory of public colonization is not an option. For me, who comes from the site of colonization, comes from the, the, the habitus of the colonizer, for me, Europe has developed the most important structures of living and learning in public education and public housing. Yet these forms are divisive and not common. Let us, in our forgetting the public, remember the sharing of housing and move beyond the regimentation of our bodies in the public museum. Thank you very much.